I am a scientist and I'm not in the business of trying to influence public policy. And I work very, very hard at not doing that. But sometimes my enthusiasm spills over or bubbles over and I ask for you, for your apology, uh, I ask uh, apologetically to put up with that. Uh, I, I don't want to think about the number of hours that I've spent in enjoying the retirement work that I'm doing. I feel like I'm 20 years younger and back at work. I love that. But I do want you to know that I know some of the scientists who are doing the work that I'm going to present tonight. I know a few just to say hi over coffee or see them at a national or international meeting. And virtually everything that I'm going to present to you tonight is sort of backdrop supported, supported, and supported. And it's not, shall we say, weak material. It's scientifically supported at more than one level. And I wanted you to know that what, oh, most of what I'm going to say belongs to other scientists. It's not my personal opinion. And when my personal opinion comes out, I'll try to remember it. Okay, let's go. Why in the world are we all here tonight? Is something going on with our aesthetic value system? That is, oh, our attitude, perspective on the beauty and the safety and serenity of our natural surroundings? I don't know why we're all here, why you're here tonight for sure, where you're coming from, but maybe it has something to do with this. For the first time ever, 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 and it's driven by economic reasons. We live at a time when specific genes can be transferred between any unrelated organisms, creating novel new things that are patentable. Many of these new things, GMOs we call them, are released out there to the environment, and most of them are capable of reproducing and can't be put back into the genie's bottle once they're out there. We feel a little bit uneasy about that. So we're going to start with a very brief story in classroom chatter, I like to call it. A little bit of history. In the 1970s, scientists discovered how to transfer DNA between unrelated organisms. And it scared the hell out of everybody. And the news media was crazy about it. Oh, a lot of biosafety rules and regulations came. Some scientists even quit working in the field. They felt so oppressed because of the government <coughs> intervention in their technologies. In the 1980s, scientists began talking about specific products. And those first products were germs, bacteria, that were genetically manipulated to be released in toxic waste sites to consume the bad things, the bad chemicals. Patents started to fly everywhere because it's unique organisms, as I said earlier. EPA announces environmental biosafety rules in the mid-1980s, and there was the first ever, and so far as I know, just about the only, I think one exception, first ever environmental releases of genetically modified bacteria into the environment. The experiments took place in California. In the 1990s, seed companies started to announce the new revolution in agriculture that was to come. Why they were in the process of providing new kinds of food plants to the world that could resist droughts, uh, had yields that superseded anything that was known, <coughs> less fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone wanted to hop aboard that financial train and there was a lot of hype to do so. Then I remember not much was being announced for a while. And a lot of the responsibilities for these products were transferred away from the EPA into the USDA because it involved food. That is not a purview of EPA. EPA's purview is to protect the environment. The USDA is to promote new foods. Promote. <coughs> That's their mission. 
Suddenly we woke up in the late 1990s and there were genetically modified corn, soy, and cotton plants all over the world. What the heck are these things anyway? Okay, I like to say that they are organisms that are genetically changed through a gene cutting splicing technique. And I know you don't know necessarily what gene cutting means, let alone gene splicing, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Typically, this happens in a laboratory. The process merges a, typically, a few genes from very different organisms, creating novel, one-of-a-kind, unique, the first patentable combinations of genes that do not occur naturally, nor do they occur by traditional crossbreeding. Did you hear what I said? This is not traditional crossbreeding. I don't care what you read in the Daily Tidings or Science Magazine or Scientific America. Okay, we are about to step into a laboratory now and I'm going to show you in about seven <coughs> slides an example of how you could build, create, engineer a genetically modified plant. And this is very typical and I'm going to show you the biological way that it is done. There are other ways, we don't have time to go into all of this tonight, the biological way. First, I'm starting with a diagram of a bacterium. And it's called agrobacterium and it's a common soil organism. And it has two kinds of genetic material. A chromosome, one, it has about a thousand genes that defines this bacterium. And it has another kind of genetic material that scientists call DNA plasmids. They're smaller, about one to three percent of the size of the bacterial chromosome. And they are, the plasmids, are the workhorse of the biotechnology industry. Things get put into that or spliced into this plasmid before they are delivered into a plant cell. For example, here is agrobacteria and that also happens to be the source of the resistance to Roundup. The genetic source of the resistance to Roundup also happens to come from agrobacteria. These are the rod-shaped <coughs> bacteria. This big blob, we'll come back to that in a moment, is a plant cell kind of piled up there on it. A second common gene that will be found in our food plants is something called Bt toxin because it comes from a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. This toxin is novel, unique also because it has a target of killing certain classes of insects. So we're going to steal away that single gene, the toxin gene, steal away the resistant gene to Roundup, put them in a test tube, and then add to that another gene from this virus. And that gene we'll call a switching gene, a regulatory gene, a rheostat. It determines how much activity is going to go on with the other two genes. We'll put that all together in a solution where we cut open the round DNA plasmid. Remember the donut that I showed you in the diagram, the agrobacterium? The DNA plasmid itself has been cut open. It's like a donut, just use the scissors, you open it up. Then, by changing the temperature of your solution and the salt content, we will have these genes come all together to meet this open plasmid the viral promoter gene, the Bt toxin gene, the Roundup resistant gene will all come together and be one happy big hug in the DNA plasma. And this is what it looks like at the top. This is a recombinant, recombined, recombinant DNA molecule, the plasmid from agrobacterium as recombined with the bacillus toxin gene, the agrobacterium Roundup resistant gene and the virus gene. Now through a Nobel Prize or two, 
we are going to go through the methodologies to put that recombinant plasmid back into agrobacteria. And it's painfully simple. Just grow the bacterium and add the recombined molecule and some of them are taken up directly or indirectly into the agrobacterium cell. Is everybody kind of with me there? You can watch Then, here we have now a recombinant agrobacterium with this special plasmid that we've just constructed. And we're going to expose some individual plant cells to this bacterium. And they conjugate. Folks, this is an unbelievable piece of biology. Bacteria do not conjugate with plant cells, except for agrobacteria. It's the only one was discovered, oh, about 50 years ago at the University of Washington. So what happens during this conjugation, I'll be darned if this plasmid that we constructed in a test tube is now going to be transferred into the plant cell nucleus. So we've gone from creating a recombinant bacterial cell to now we've created a recombinant plant cell. And that plant is now endowed permanently in its chromosomes with the genetic material that allows it to make the Bt toxin, that allows it to resist being sprayed with Roundup. And there's a viral gene to go along with it that tells that cell, make lots of this stuff, because you're going to need it when you get out on the farm. Lots of it through a variety of patents, this individual single plant cell can be made to grow out and reproduce a parental, real-looking plant cell. Whether it be a soybean plant, or a corn plant, or a sugar beet plant, whatever. By putting it on a nutrient medium, giving it some light, and allowing them to grow. And when you get to, oh, this little size here on the left, a uh, quarter of an inch or so, you can spray that plate with Roundup. And anything that is on that plate that is resistant to the Roundup is going to continue to grow on the right side of the plate, the happy green looking little plantlets. The ones on the left did not receive that plasmid did not receive the Roundup resistance gene. And they died. They don't, they're not wanted. So when these little guys on the right are planted in the soil, they'll regenerate then the full plant. And that's all there is to making a genetically modified plant. And it can be done by the tens of thousands in one On one slide here, I've tried to reproduce what we've just gone through, where we've taken genes from one or two soil, uh, from two soil bacteria, and a gene from a plant virus. We've combined them in a test tube with the plasmid. We've made the plant cell take it up, and we've regenerated in this diagram a plant cell in which every single kernel on that cob has the genetic endowment to resist Roundup to produce toxin. And you know those kernels are embryos of the corn plant to come, in which means there are tens of thousands of cells in that single kernel of corn. And every single one of those tens of thousands of cells is manufacturing the toxin and is making the material, the protein material, to resist Roundup. That's how life works. So I want to emphasize on this slide, there were no yield enhancing genes that we played with, right? Nothing. Nothing. There are no drought survival genes that we sent over to that individual cell. No enhanced carbon sequestering, climate change fighting genes. No nutrient enhancing genes. 
in commercial production anywhere. And for all of this to work, this organism is dependent upon external factors. That is, the weeds that are going to be sprayed have to be sensitive to Roundup. And the insects for which the plant's going to be protected have to be sensitive to the toxin. One morning in 2002, I woke up and read a news report that in that year, there were 150 million acres of biotechnology crops in the world. Five years later, doubled. Now we are the equivalent in 16 years out of seven states of Oregon. You know, rather than saying it's 450 million acres, what the heck does that mean? It's equivalent to seven states of Oregon, the entire state. This is big business, big, big, big business. And it's an American business, and what can be wrong with that? <laughs> Okay, let's go back to the classroom and we'll talk a little bit about economics and what GMO food is that we probably all ingest every day. But this slide reminds me I want to stop here for a brief moment and take any questions that you have. Yes? Uh, we're talking about BT toxin. Uh, I believe that that is just used for animal feed, not for corn that's fed to humans at this point, is that correct? No, wrong, wrong, okay. Yeah. It's used for animal feed, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples in a moment. Mm -hmm. But we're in, we are ingesting it, uh, right or wrong, it may be heat killed, it may not be heat killed, but yeah. uh, whoever eats corn on this planet is ingesting the toxin. Yeah. So in high fructose corn syrup, um, do they, Use that same corn? Uh, yes, about? that's correct, but in all fairness, I'll tell you that it's unlikely that there are any direct GMO genes or GMO products in that corn oil and other oils that are genetically engineered. And that's maybe that's the good news, but the bad news is to get them out of there, they have to put carcinogenic solvent extractives in to get it out, like hexane and other nasty solvents that are used to purify those oils. So six of one, half dozen of another, how do you want it? You want it in a oil that's been exposed to a carcinogen or you want it off the cob? It's your choice. And I'm being cynical at the moment in case you didn't realize. <laughs> yes? I was wondering about the temperature. Was it first when they first combined agro plasma? You mentioned the temperature change. What? Why is that? Is that critical? Uh, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, when the DNA molecules are coming together, it's absolutely necessary to have an elevated temperature uh, around, let's see, 90 degrees centigrade, so uh, 180, 190 degrees Fahrenheit. And the molecules are vibrating with all of that temperature, and they won't come together. So you drop the temperature, like the body temperature, and you add some salt in the molecules, relax and come together. Yes? There's a mention of uh, no um, nutritional benefit, correct? No nutritional benefit in, in the genetic... Uh, yes, that's correct. So is there any evidence, any um, scientific research that proves uh, biological degradation? in the consumption of GMOs? Yeah, thank you for asking that question, and it reminds me quickly here. Uh, I, I, I did not tell you at the front end why I don't like to talk about the health effects of these products, because it's an unwinnable argument. There is so much uh, cloudiness, uh, counter-arguments uh, in the scientific literature even, that I, although if it was clear, I would be capable of understanding it and tell you about it. But I don't want to tell you something that I'm not 100% behind and convinced myself. And right now, today, it's just not possible. The proper science has not yet, amazingly so, not yet been done. The proper and good science has not been done. Yes. So you just said anybody who eats corn. Are you saying all corn? There is no non-GMO corn case, around anymore? In case I don't. 
uh, in case I forget later, you know, I can say I'll get to that. I will tell you that corn, uh, uh, cotton seed oil and products, uh, canola oil, uh, uh, canola plants, and uh, uh, soybean plants occupy between 85 to 95 percent of the acreage planted in the United States. Wow. Commercial acreage, commercial farm acreage. So they're out there, but at a premium. And I will tell you that most of those seeds leave the country to go where GMO products are not desired. Oh. I'm, I'm, I, I don't think I got my question right. Okay, please try me again. Were you saying that all corn, even though somebody tried to keep it as organic corn, has been <clears throat> somehow crossbred? Uh, that's a little bit more tricky to answer. Uh, and I will answer uh, basically uh, of the non-GMO food product left, like corn, is even the organic corn contaminated? And the sad, sad answer is, in certain parts of the country, a simple, easy, clear yes. In other parts of the country, I really don't know. What about this part? <laughs> uh, stick my neck out because nobody knows. And my own personal opinion is that it's unlikely that uh, local in Oregon, locally grown organic corn is significantly cross-contaminated because there is not that much GMO corn acreage in Oregon. What about the drifting pollen? Okay, that's one topic, damn it, I pulled for my presentation tonight so I could do the economics. But that's uh, a big but, question. Yeah, uh, and Anna alluded to that beautifully uh, about the uh, beta uh, products, that's the beet, the red beets, the orange beets, the kale, uh, the sugar beets. Uh, and correctly, I agree with the number that Anna used. I, I see the same number, two to four mile separation distance, uh, and that's even recommended by the seed producers. So that is a problem in southern Oregon. It's the beta products, yes, not corn. They just recently suspended that uh, four mile res restricted area, did they not? Correct. And, and, and who is behind that and for what reason? Yeah. Uh, that would be the USDA who believes in the concept of coexistence and uh, that basically GMO food products and non-GMO food products are substantially the same. So we, that means not necessarily functional. They don't say whether they're talking genetically or functionally. Functionally, they're not the same. <laughs> but genetically, they are substantially the same because we've only changed about three genes out of 20 to 40,000 total genes in a plant. So that's substantially the same, but that's not where the issue is. The issue is the function and performance out in the environment. Let me get started again. See, I'm talking too slow. Okay, folks, 193 pounds is the average number uh, for us Americans in the consumption of genetically engineered foods. And if you don't believe it, I'll give you some more information in a moment. Uh, and that does include such things as chicken and beef that's fed genetically engineered foods. Uh, here's all the 100% pure oil products that are all derived from genetically modified seed stock. Canola, uh, cotton seed oil, and uh, sometimes olive oil because they contaminate it with GMO oil. Mm -hmm. So watch if you buy a bottle of olive oil, read the uh, bottle label carefully. GMO snacks on the left side, anything look familiar? Yeah, <laughs> those look familiar to me. But thank goodness there is a counter on the right side with a very similar product. And if you, I don't think you can see it, so I'm going to point it out. Uh, preservatives and additives for coloring on all of these on the left, virtually none of these on the right. So not only GMO on the left, but additives and artificial coloring agents. And hey, had your cornflakes yet? <laughs> you know where, where they are. They are virtually all genetically modified. And what is this you're paying for it? Whether you eat it or not, what in the world am I talking about? 
No, it's worse than that. <laughs> okay, I've talked earlier about promises and hype and all of that good stuff. It costs us money, and why is that? The GMO technology is costing us money. Because of speculation and hype creates financial stampede. Everybody wants a piece of the financial activity of the promises of these GMO organisms. Why not? That's, that's the American way. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. But unfortunately, these increased expectations increased all operating court costs, from the tractors to the fertilizer to the seeds, etc. GMO seed costs, as an example, doubled in the last six years. What else do you know that doubled during the deep recession? Doubled in costs. Huh? I, I don't know of anything. Tripled in costs in the last 10 years. Unfortunately, at this time, there's little to no enforced regulations, as you alluded to a moment ago, in dropping the two to four mile radius. There is a lot of professional lobbying going on that causes GMO crop expansions because those are being pushed by federal policies. And I hope to get into that. Let's, let's just jump right in. First of all, I want to tell you that there's patent consolidation. Two companies, Monsanto and Pioneer, own about 70% of all the patents that have been produced in the last 30 years in the agricultural biotechnology industry. Ah, okay, that's what industry does. What's, what's possible costs for that? Okay, seed and fee costs are taking money out of our pocket and squeezing the farmers in between. Look at this. From about 90, uh, 1995 to 2011, the cost of uh, the CPI index increased 45%, consumer price index. The cost for corn seed up 259%. The cost for soybean seed 325 and cotton seed almost 500% higher than the CPI. Part of those increases come from the so-called technology fees, which I never knew existed until about a month ago. But in addition to the high prices the farmers paid for a bag of seeds, the technology fee, uh, technology fee says, you know, we did a lot of R&D. We have a patent on this. So we want to recoup our research dollars. So for every bag of seed that you, you buy for an acre of corn, we need another 60 bucks. Sorry, farmer. Soybean, 24. And cotton, my God, over $400. Must be a lot of money growing cotton. I don't know. Okay, some more CPI, but we're going to narrow that down to the consumer price index for foods. Not in general, but foods. So a comparable period of 12, 13 years actually did a little more than double. That's our food cost has doubled in the last 12 years, and then some. But GMO corn products, up 287%. GMO soybean products, 216. And for me, I needed a, a comparison. So I said, what did the non-GMO wheat do? Well, it was 141, which is close to the overall CPI for food. <coughs> GMO canola oil up 230%, etc. Non-GMO peanut oil, 140, which is close to the overall CPI. Olive oil, I don't know what happened there. They only went up 60%. Cost of fertilizers increased significantly as well. Total revenues, please look at this curve carefully. We'll come back to it a couple of times. Okay, we have billions of dollars income on the left and years going across. And this is the GMO uh, plant era. Yeah, increased revenue, uh, flattened out. What's going on? <coughs> Michael? This is revenue to the companies that make the GMO seeds? Uh, it's for seeds and crop sales. Okay. Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. But in 2005, <coughs> something happened. Wow, the revenues from corn went from 10 billion to 20 billion in one year. In that second year, it went from 20 billion to 40 billion. How did that happen? 
do we have that many acres left in the United States for farming? Or was the crop yield going up like crazy because we're talking about GMOs? Oh, what happened was the U.S. Congress got involved and started making noise about the U.S. Biofuel Incentive Program. Mm. Okay, the blue is the bushels of corn in billions that go into animal feed. The red is for human consumption and seed replacement. And the yellow, come on strong, is growing corn to make starch to make alcohol. And Congress has quite an incentive program coming along. Where did this land come from? I just got through telling you, I don't think we have any more farmland to speak of in this country. Well, where it came from is what's called the prairie grasslands and prairie pothole biome. For those of you that are not familiar with this situation, 15 million acres were transferred out of pristine 10,000 year old land that's never been farmed, never been used for anything, and it's now growing corn. And those 15 million acres were converted in six years. Can you imagine the energy draining the water, filling in the potholes, leveling the ground, then tilling it, fertilizing it, and planting the corn. Oh my God, why did 15 million acres go? That's 25% of the ground area of Oregon. Why? What state is that in? Ah, uh, funny you should ask. Is that actually, oh, okay. Okay, here's where it's all happening. This is a so-called corn belt. Would you believe that northern Montana has converted a million and a half acres in three years to grow corn? That's corn belt. Eastern Wyoming, not too far behind. Well, they grow corn in North and South Dakota. They sure as heck grow corn in Iowa and look in western Minnesota. So that's where three of the 15 million acres came from. And by the way, the prairie pothole was left over from the last glacial age 10,000 years ago. How, how is that related to GMO? It's all GMO crop that's going into the ground. Thank you. Perfect timing on that question. And the reason why it's GMO corn is because there isn't enough non-GMO seed left in the world to, for the farmers to get a hold of. And the farmers have been told my God, your yields are going to go up. You're going to have great response. To like they did in India. Like they did in India. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not criticizing the farmers. This is their life. This is how they feed their family. Money is available. I'm sorry, taxpayer money is available as the incentive to do this, to remove what we used to call wetlands. Remember? 20, 30 years ago, how they were protected. We just dumped 15 million acres, loaded, filled in all those potholes. Are we up in Canada with that, with the rest of the pothole country up there? Yes. Or now, pothole country basically goes more or less from the northwest area down towards the southeast in this part of the United States, but does spill over a little into Canada. Why, why the focus on corn? One of the things that is nutritionally, there's, not, there's no nutritional value to it. And yet there's such a focus to plant this, um, there is no nutritional value hardly in corn. You may not realize how complex that question is. It's a multifaceted answer. The short version is, first the incentive program is for corn, uh, for alcohol, and soybean for biodiesel. Soybean does not do it too, too well in the prairie pothole region, I understand. So that's one of the reasons it's corn. Uh, another reason it's corn is that Congress said, we need and we will see that you're well taken care of for 14 billion gallons of ethanol for corn. And we're even going to partly fund some of the industries to ferment that product for you. And we're even going to pay public uh, monies into insurance companies to lower your farming insurance premiums 
so that you grow corn in this area. And oh, by the way, now they need 15 billion gallons of ethanol up from 14. So those are some of the kinds of complex answers that I would give to that really good question. This is on a treadmill, too, to go to something like uh, 20 billion gallons in 2030 or something? It's on a treadmill to go up from there. Yes. Correct. <coughs> So this slide is something that I put together from an article uh, that someone else wrote about the pending legislation in the current farm bill. Things kind of kicked into, into, into gear in 2005, but right now the U.S. Con uh, Senate has passed what I'm going to tell you. The House of Representatives has not yet agreed to the Senate version. Sound familiar? But the Senate version today for the new farm bill with the biofuels component says $7 billion until it's used up to subsidize 62% of the premiums that farmers would have to pay for their insurance. Uh, expansion of the problems that the farmer could have still being eligible for a refund from the insurance company. And some of you may know, last year, 2012, was a hell of a bad year in some parts, some parts of the Corn Belt with a drought. Mm -hmm. Some of the insurance companies went broke, and taxpayers through Congress now decided, let's bail those insurance companies out mm -hmm. and give them, well, let's schedule seven billion and let's see how far it goes. That's part of the Farm Bill right now. But the connection to GMO products to me is not any more clear and not any louder than my last point on this <coughs> slide. There is a national lobbying organization, of course, for the biotechnology industry. And it's simply called the Biotechnology Organization. The chief of that wrote an open letter to Congress recently. The legislation is still pending. He's trying to lobby Congress. It says, reauthorizing this Farm Bill Energy Program and providing robust mandatory funding for the energy title, as it's called, I like to say energy entitlements, will help U.S. industrial biotechnology companies innovate and develop new products. Well, my comment to that is kind of multifold. This is not the auto industry, folks, where the, our auto industry five years ago was on the brink of bankruptcy. We're talking about Monsanto and we're talking about Pioneer, very healthy, financially speaking, American corporations. They don't need tax, in my personal opinion, they don't need taxpayer money to innovate. But innovate. Is there something wrong with what they've got now? Is that why they need to innovate and improve? What, what, oh my God, what are they telling us? What are they telling us? Oh, this slide is to remind me that these biofuel programs for corn is not restricted to the United States. Other of our trading partners can also join the club as the good folks in Guatemala have. They're very wealthy, large landowners that switch to GMO corn and they're shipping it back to the U.S. for ethanol. That's a non-edible variety of corn, by the way. And the peasants in Central, some Central American companies, this is Guatemala, are receiving edible corn back from us, grown here in the United States, at elevated costs. And the wealthy farmers have spread out, like in the United States, they planted every corner they can find with the GMO corn for ethanol. So the peasants no longer have a much land left to grow their own personal corn. Follow that argument, I'll read it. Guatemala exports biofuel corn, biofuel sugarcane to the U.S from large-scale wealthy farm owners and imports expensive GMO <coughs> corn to eat. And these peasants are in a median between two highways in Guatemala growing their little patch of corn for their personal 
consumption. And we were told that the GMO technology is here to feed the world. Is this how it works? <sighs> I'm sorry. Okay, we don't need to hear about that. I call this multiple disasters coming from the political hype. The GMOs are better than sliced bread. That means rising costs to all of us, from GMO seeds to corn crop to the farm belt going on and the conversion of lands. 900 million tons of carbon dioxide have been lost from that prairie conversion in the last six years, and that's a concern in climate change. What in the world does 900 million tons of gas look like? I will tell you. If we took every automobile in the United States and every automobile in the country of China, we'd have about 450 million automobiles. That's how much carbon dioxide is generated in six years coming from one year of use of 450 million automobiles. The Arts History Library will be closing in five minutes. I only have five minutes to go. No, no, no. <laughs> I said, all of this nonsense is driven by false GMO promises and federal incentives. But I said then, wait, I'm not done. What false GMO promises? I haven't addressed that. So out to the farms. How do these products perform? What I want you to know here in this slide from Potash Corporation, it's the amount of fertilizer that's being used, that's the white line, and the pounds or tonnage of grain that's coming back since GMO crops were introduced in white arrow. 27% increase in fertilizer, approximately. 17% increase in grain. That's a ratio that does not make me feel comfortable. The more you put in, fewer you get out. Uh, this is not a green revolution. This ain't a green revolution. Well, green Fed. is money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With regards to yield, uh, a lot of us don't do well on graphs, and I have another table right after this, but let me just show you quickly decades across the bottom. Uh, bushels of corn produced per acre in the United States. The red boxes are what I like to call the technology revolution that started in the 1950s, and it shows that every single year the average United States corn yield is up about two bushels, two bushels, two bushels, two bushels every year. And in the GMO era, the green part, the same things happened. It didn't go from 2 to 2.5 or 2 to 3. It stayed at 2. And so we say the slope of this line stayed the same. This is all United States averages. So when the GMO corn started to come online, the average yield there was the same rate as if they never came online. So what would have happened without the GMO introduction? Would it have flattened out or would it have continued to rise? There is no reason to say that it would have flattened out. And I think... Pretty flat at the beginning. Oh, okay. I, I wanted to save time <laughs> and I didn't go through the details. Do you mean here and here? Okay. This is in the 1800s. And I'll say the bus never left the curb. There was no increase in yield. They were still burying fish with it. That's right. And not even that. Very little to no fertilizer, no irrigation, no sophisticated harvesting equipment, and no cross hybridization. Some of that started here around World War II period. And since that time, there has been an exhaustive, extensive corn cross hybridization using <coughs> corn varieties from around the world coupled with very sophisticated fertilizer, sometimes irrigation capability, and very sophisticated uh, uh, harvesting equipment. And that gradually came online, of course, over the years. 
<coughs> Let me show you this. I'm getting close to the end. Oh, a table. A corn contest that's held every year in Ohio. Data reported by Ohio State University scientists. Years 2011 and 12. 19 corn varieties in this test, three non-GMO, 16 GMO. And let's compare the corn yields and bushels per acre. Average for all was 219, and that is incredibly high. The national average is about 160. So they know how to grow corn in Ohio. The non-GMO <coughs> plants, the average was 221. The GMO average was 219. Not mathematically different. They're equal. They're equivalent. Okay? Same year, same state, same contest, and so on. But in all fairness, if you go in and look at the raw data, you'll find that 10 varieties of GMO yields were less than the non-GMO. So that's your argument for why the red it would continue on up. Exactly, exactly. We've separated out the non-GMO, and I can tell you that in 11 and 12, they performed as well. But in August, six GMO yields were greater than the non-GMO. Are we using the same variety of corn here? Oh, no. No, I mean, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, there are GMO types of corn, and then there are corn varieties, genetic varieties. So, no, a big, okay. a mixture. Yeah. Okay, that's the yield story, and I'm sticking to it. Effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the Roundup use. Uh, this article came out about 10 days ago in Science Journal. This is a coy, uh, soybean field in Illinois. Where are the soybeans? <laughs> the brown stalks are the weeds that are susceptible to Roundup, the green are the resistant. This is the kind of resistant weeds we're seeing time and time again in this nation because of the overuse of the herbicide. The library is now closed. Multiple herbicide resistances in weeds, does that remind you of something? 10% of the weeds are resistant to five different types of herbicides, 25% to three, Farming costs, hey, that's the bottom line. For herbicide and cotton, it's increased five-fold. Spray, 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 more, 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 more because of their resistance. And in soy, it's up six-fold. I couldn't find a number for corn. <laughs> what does that remind us of? It reminds me of the analogs, and it's a good one for antibiotic resistance. <laughs> What happens when you need another antibiotic if the first one from the doc doesn't cure your infection? You go back, doc, I'm not feeling better, give me another one. So he pulls another one out of the hat. Chances are it's going to cost you a little more for that second one. Maybe you're going to have a little bit more side effects. And that could go on to maybe the treatment goes from a pill to an injection. An injection to an IV. And then from the IV into emergency room, etc. Hey, this is what's happening to the control of weeds on 62 million documented acres in the United States. We have the chemical companies hard at work coming up and finding new chemicals and new chemical resistant markers to put into the food crops. Help is on the way, probably at higher costs. Use of less herbicide, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't happening. This is data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It shows about approximately a 13-fold increase in the use of Roundup. Glyphosate is the, is the same as Roundup. Glyphosate is the active chemical. So let's say Roundup has increased 13-fold during the startup and coming forward of the GMO era. By Monsanto stock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you something about that. Oh. <laughs> Well, Overuse of the toxin has caused the same thing of insect resistances, like we've got insect weeds, uh, resistant weeds. And I'm going to skip ahead. Well, can I ask a question about the method of the Roundup? 
Yes. Is, um, what studies have been done to know what the effects of Roundup are on the human body or animal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to go there because it's so controversial and there's no way to win that argument. Was there any studies on it? Uh, there have been a variety of studies and uh, some of them show relatively dramatic effects. For example, uh, irritable bowel, uh, 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 irritations in the stomachs of farm animals that have been fed high doses, if not 100% GMO corn. Uh, the critics say those are not statistically accurate research experiments that shouldn't have been published. Go back home and try it again. And that's where we are now. Well, I'm not so much talking about the GMO aspect of it as the increase in the use of the herbicides on that, on those plants. Uh, as it, the Vietnamese. Yeah, that's the, uh, that is a, a hard thing also to argue in. John, did you? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I heard about uh, Roundup just recently was one of the really damaging things that it does to the plants that are resistant to it is that Roundup is a chelating agent. Yes. And it chelates all of the vital minerals into the soil yes. so that they're no longer bioavailable to the plants. So you may as well be eating cardboard if you're eating GMO products. Okay, what he just said, uh, chelating agent means that Roundup, indeed, is correct, uh, is a chelating agent and it binds positively charged minerals like manganese, magnesium, and calcium. Okay does not release them out into the soil. Uh, but clinical studies that connect that to specific illnesses or to very specific deficiencies in the soil and in the plants have, to my knowledge, not yet been done. I can tell you anecdotal stories like a non-GMO, non uh, non-Roundup user farmer here on this side of the street and the Roundup user on the other, the winter rains cause the runoff and that feel onto his and the texture of the soil changes. And that's anecdotal. You can read that in the newspaper. But that doesn't allow me to say that there's some scientific validity behind that, and it doesn't allow me to tell you what that is. So we need more research. Amazingly so, after all of these years. Let me wrap this up, folks, uh, and tell you that there are many promises that this technology has brought forward, including yields. The federal energy uh, policies have played a role in the production, on the encouragement of the use of GMO products actually throughout the world. And those problems that I have are land conversion, loss of carbon from that soil, 10,000 year old virgin soil, loss of biodiversity. That area that I showed you is the flyway for 75% of the North American, South American bird migration patterns. 75% what's happened to their water, winter water sources. All of those potholes are now, well, on 15 million acres, they're filled in. I hope you agree that uh, GMOs have probable, comparable crop yields, but at increased consumer costs. That's a problem that I have. And sadly, I feel Roundup has run its course. It's no longer effective on many millions of acres. Occurrences of super weeds that are difficult to control because of their resistances are off the farm. And there are two scientific studies, sadly. One is in Oregon, and the other is in North Dakota. Our problem is in Central Oregon in Deschutes County. BTU sadly has also run its course because the insects are massively, massive acres of insect resistance. BT is a natural occurring biological control toxin used in organic farming since the 1920s. No problems reported by those folks with resistances until the GMO era and that resistance problem has started about six to seven years ago. We've gotten worse every year. Finally, after 17 years, there is not one single GMO miracle crop in production to withstand drought or other harsh environments. And there's no, as yet, no nutritionally supplemented 
GMO product on the market, no golden rice at this stage, or any other for that matter. A lot of heavy stuff. I don't want to end there. Let's just have a little bit of fun. What do we do about all of this starter guard? Hey, if you have it already. No, please, that anything labeled organic, by definition, is not GMO. Avoid packaged junk food. Boy, that's a tough one for me. <laughs> Stop or cut back eating factory farm meat, and I mean corn-fed beef, chicken, etc. It's all GMO corn. It's all GMO soy. Go to grass-fed and having more fun. Hey, you have a friend or a neighbor in Washington? Call them up. Tell them to vote the right way next week. Products like vegetable oils, I mentioned this earlier, despite them being marked as 100% natural, is supporting the biotechnology seed industry. And folks, educate your friends and family, please, about what I have to say tonight. Thank you. So we're going to have time for questions, um, but I do want to take just one moment to really invite you all that last point about talking to your families and friends. It, it's that personal contact that's going to make the difference because you're someone they trust, you're their friend. Um, GMO for Jackson County is certainly available to come and give presentations if you're part of the group um, that you think would be interested in hearing about this topic. Um, have Ray come, have someone from GMO Free come. We have a library of movies available. Um, we need volunteers. There's lots of work to be done between now and May. Um, there is a sign-up sheet here. Um, we send out about once a month a newsletter with updates where you can find out. Ray's definitely going to be speaking around. We'll have a larger room next time for sure. Um, so if, if you got value out of tonight, which I can't imagine you didn't, then it would be a way to find out when uh, others would have an opportunity to hear Ray. And if you've heard what's happening right now in Washington in terms of the millions of dollars being funneled in to block the labeling, no, that is going to happen here. The airways are going to just be flooded with information and misinformation, and we need to be educated enough to know the difference. And we need to be able to put out our own information. So that's a plug for financial support. Uh, we, we really are at a point right now where there's some major investment we want to do in a campaign manager, in polling, and we need financial uh, support to be able to do that. Um, so, uh, Christina, will you want to just pass the, uh, you had some... I'm passing the sign-up oh, sheet oh, for oh, the oh. newsletter. You can mark that you want to volunteer, to volunteer for lots of things. We have donation envelopes. You can donate just off the top of your checkbook, or you can buy a button or a bumper sticker to show your support. We have a few non-GMO shopping guides and other material out on the table if you did have a chance to pick it up. Right. And um, as Ray alluded a couple times, there's so many areas that he wasn't able to cover, but that's why I want to shift gears now to question and answer so that if there's something you really came wanting to know about in particular, um, you'll be able to, to get that answer. And please, if you need to go, feel free to, um, to, to move on, but I do want to once again thank you all for coming. And I want to put in one more plug for the initiative in Washington State. They're like us, they vote by mail, and so people are voting right now. The uh, tally will be done Tuesday evening of next week. So even if you don't know people there, if you want to take action immediately and do something that will count, go to their website, yesonfive22.com, yes and you can sign up to call uh, people in Washington State. They'll give you a list and <coughs> urge them to support that initiative. It's well, labeling? Yes. By the way, I forgot as usual, I have some uh, cards here with my name and email address on it. If any of you would like to send any comments, uh, questions, I would appreciate it. And I also have some blank cards, uh, which would be the suggestion box equivalent. Appreciate any <laughs> feedback uh, that you might have. Great. Are you, you, you going to put this on YouTube? To, yep. Um, uh, okay. So, yes. Right up right here. Um, you are at OSU. What would be the attitude of the science bill with the agricultural science? 
objective side items? Uh, you have to separate uh, the administration from individual scientists. And it's probably one of the two, what I would view as one of the two leaders in the world uh, that has made technical contributions to GMO biosafety and uh, all of the cross-pollination issues, problems associated with that. One of the two most famous people in the world is at Oregon State. And this uh, woman is clearly one of the hardest working, most bright people that I've ever read stuff about. And I'm sure she'd probably like to give you an earful about your question. Uh, so uh, if the administration is keeping quiet, uh, it's really for political reasons because they enjoy funding is like any other organization. But you need for your opinion to get down into the working core of the university research scientists and professors. And you will probably see a mixture of attitudes and beliefs. And in my experiences, I used to catch hell in the 80s. Why are you doing this work, et cetera, et cetera. And I will tell you that as recently as this week, okay. reading a newspaper, not local, a national newspaper, there is still misinformation, misunderstanding, and the promises of the technology still prevail. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complicated answer to a, a big question. Hi. Just a curiosity. If this was some of the, going back to that 15 million acres, yeah. That would seem like that's a significant number to happen in a six-year period. That would seem like that would, I mean, it wasn't over you know, a century or over, exactly. or, or even over a couple of decades. Yes. So my question is, is how did that bypass the Endangered Species Act and environmental yes. impact statements? I mean, if, if, if somebody tried to pull that here, it just wouldn't happen, you know what I'm saying, All right? You know, so how did that... How did that come about that there wasn't a, a state through a federal court, you know, a lawsuit or anything? How did that how did that come about? Okay. Our mindset on that problem, ours, I'm thinking most of us in this room, maybe most of us in Oregon, most of us in the Northwest, relates to, oh my god, if that was happening as a clear cut clear cut in an old growth forest, it never would happen in Oregon, Washington, or California. And all I can say is that the mindset and the how, how people work in the Midwest and where they work and their political beliefs and their philosophy of life is just plain different. <laughs> we are in the same country, but I, I don't want to get into color states, but it's a political support system right up through the lobbying efforts, through their, their representatives in the Midwest that caused these horrible oversights to happen. My personal opinion, I've not read that. Well, the only reason I'm, I'm asking is because that's right in the, in the flyway of like the monarch butterfly that's, you know, the whole world's concerned about this magnificent thing. And it just would have seemed like that just wouldn't have been allowed to happen. So it's really phenomenal that that happened like that. It really is. Yeah, I, I would love to have a beer or a cup of coffee with you. We could kick that around some more. My philosophy is the same as yours. You know, I'm an environmental scientist, and I wonder the same things. Well, a good cup of coffee would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Fair trade. I, I grew up in northern Minnesota, Amen. and we couldn't grow corn there because it was too cold. Mm. Didn't have one enough growing season. But now the corn it ripens in 70 days instead of 90 days. So they've opened up millions of acres of corn production oh. there just due to that change in the, the growth. And as an environmentalist, I would add to it that, yes, thank you, and that's true, and I support that. But I see that that brings another problem. Instead of the land lying fallow perhaps five months of the year, maybe it's lying fallow seven months of the year. And for me, that means there's no, there's nothing there like the prairie grass to continue to sequester elevated carbon dioxide levels in the air. So, one slide I missed uh, comes to mind now. 
It's a publication that came out in August of this year from the United Nations Trade and uh, Trade and Science or something like that, written by about 100 scientists around the world. And basically, the bottom line is what we are doing, we, they point to developed nations, the United States in this case, they're talking. What we're doing is just plain not going to last. It's not sustainable mm -hmm. in that we need to do our agriculture in a different way. And it's called sustainable agriculture. It's called agroecology. When I was younger, it was called organic farming. <laughs> oh, more or less the same things. Not push harder, push harder, more, more. You know, there is an article out this year also about how Americans send 40, the largest item, volume and weight, the largest material that goes to our dumps in this United States is food, wasted food. 40% wow. of our food crop goes out the door. 40%. And this is not a matter of needing to feed the world. This is just a matter of getting, you know, looking at politics, looking at distribution, changing our way. So if we back off, don't worry. And maybe if we don't have those 15 million acres of corn anymore, who's, 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 who's going to suffer? We're not going to starve people. That's the point that I kind of want to make. And sustainable agricultural yields through research and technology these days are getting very close to what we see as I, in the numbers I presented to you, the 160 bushels per acre of corn, but it's uh, sustainable ag uh, corn yields when done in the best science is about 70% of the level that happens when we really pour the fertilizer, etc., to GMO corn. So even sustainable, I think we're, we're getting there. And the soil loves it, and Mother Earth loves it. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions. My first question is, um, is there any other counties or states that are going in similar efforts like Jackson County? And the second question is totally unrelated to the first one. Um, do you think that if we were to focus on energy policy and to rework that, would that help in um, kind of combating the GMO efforts? Well, I don't know how that, the last question first. By the way, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Anna or Bart to add, answer his first question. Probably better qualified than I. Are there counties in the nation that are thinking of going to your welfare? In California, there are three counties. Yeah. We're in mm -hmm. right. uh, Mendocino and Trinity. Trinity. And in Washington State, there's one county, uh, San Juan. Right. Uh, but Hawaii. But none of, the, none of those counties really had any GMO agriculture ongoing when they, they passed. They have banned GMOs in those counties. But yes, those are all GMO free. Um, if, if our measure passes, we'll be the first county across the nation where there is active GMO crop um, activity. And I think it's worth pointing out, if people aren't aware of what happened just a while back with the set in the Senate Bill 633, which then became 863, um, said that all matters of seed and seed products were the purview of the state. And this was a measure that was passed in order that measures like ours could not move forward. They did give an exemption to Jackson County because we were already on the ballot. And there were other counties that were trying to move forward with similar measures, which now are probably not going to happen. Well, J Josephine County has been um, making some movement, so so they will see what what they're able to do with that. Um, but see, so now it's much easier to just fight Jackson County than <laughs> yeah. rather than all of these um, because now the state uh, controls that. So. So the only reason Jackson County was exempted then in um, SB 833 was because the initiative had already received the amount of signatures necessary to be put on the ballot? Right. Okay, that's the only reason. 
Well, I mean, that it, was it was state lobbying. State. It was it was, you know, was the support of key legislators. Yeah. Do you know who those legislators were? Uh, well, Peter Buckley, Peter Buckley. You know, <laughs> carried the the banner. <clears throat> On the House side, and Alan Bates. Mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. yeah. However, so, so. This let me let me try to yeah, answer this gentleman's uh, uh, second no, question. Uh, <clears throat> the technology that we're currently use, using to derive ethanol from corn is as old as homebrew. It's crude by current technological standards, and there has to be a better way. And uh, you're beginning to see mentioning of this and, and some uh, literature uh, research being done to find other kinds of plant matter other than corn uh, to be used as a biofuel to generate ethanol. And that's in an R&D stage and it's clearly got to be, there has to be many, many products out there much better than the crude old time starch to glucose the ethanol system from the corn that we're currently using. It's just not ready yet. But it's still R and D. It's a significant factor in the growth of the corn and right. the de yeah. demolition yeah. of a lot of natural acreage. It went from uh, 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 biofuel from corn went from approximately five to ten percent uh, of the total corn pre two thousand and five to more than forty percent uh, by about two two thousand eight. So if they drop the biofuel requirements and subsidies and so forth, you could expect that that would. Right. So, so that, that, would be, that would be your hope. That one's hope. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, I had said this woman, but you sound like you wanted just to uh, tag on. I think I just, um, it has to do with if, um, <laughs> okay, I just had it here. If it passes in the state, yep. then if if uh, fifteen one nineteen this passes, is the county initiative. this is Jackson, Jackson County. County. Yeah. This state. is this is the county initiative, mm -hmm. but there is also a statewide initiative. That's right. That already passed. No, in the state of Washington, there's a labeling state okay. initiative, okay. which yeah. is coming up next Tuesday. It might be okay. Yeah. There may be one in Oregon down the line that's yet to be seen, but right now, vote yes on 15119 is Jackson County. Okay. And we like to emphasize the yes because it is a ban, so some people you know, just want to start getting that in people's awareness that to ban, you need to vote yes. Right. Okay. It's okay. affirmative. So let's go over here. So when Jeffrey Smith came last year, he mentioned that he felt that a 6% shift in corporate profits would initiate a change in their policy of using the genetically modified ingredients automatically without, uh, do you agree with that statement? Or uh, do more you information, a 6% shift in what? In, in the corporate profit from their products. If, if we all said, we're not gonna buy Kellogg's, we're not gonna do this, we're gonna buy only organic or the GMO free stamped products. If, you know, individually I'm looking for, you know, kind of empowerment here, what we can do, what we can tell our friends, do you agree with that 6% shift in profit that will cause a change in their practice, or do you not really agree with that? I don't know what the number is, but it has to get their attention. And I can tell you ways in which I think there is something going on already. First of all, uh, Monsanto this year has withdrawn their permits from all of Europe to uh, allow them to bring seeds in plant and grow more GMOs. You're not gonna, you're not gonna do that in Europe as well. Uh, number one. Uh, number two, they do have labeling. All the countries, yeah. almost all the countries in Europe do label. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to say was, uh, I happen to have read the last two quarterly statements about the financial prowess uh, of Monsanto. You know, you can go to Yahoo Finance and read all of that stuff. They've had record profits this year. So whatever happened in Europe is not yet trickling down. And uh, uh, the other thing that I wanted to say that I just remembered, uh, Monsanto and one other company, and I can't remember the name of the other company, has bought up, passed, it's happened, 
and owns approximately 80% of the value in all of the other seed companies that exist in the world that are not GMO seeds. DuPont? With well, that kind of a move, that tells me that there's some long corporate thinking that patented, which they're doing, non-GMO seeds from secret existing seed producers has some kind of a strategy evolving uh, uh, in Monsanto. And it ain't genetically engineered. And, and this chart here, it out. Yes. Uh, notice this is, shows the consolidation of the various seed companies. Ah, <laughs> just how many companies Monsanto has bought up Syngenta DuPont that it's just becoming more and more consolidated all the time. And that's outdated. And it's outdated. And uh, again, as a gardener, diversity is what we need. We need more diversity of our seeds, not fewer, yeah. fewer control. We need to stop the monopoly of our food supply. Yes. yes. Stop one it's very center. dangerous. Yes. Yes. And that's the right word. Uh, we're not just talking American industry, we're not talking profits, we're, we are talking our food. Thank you for using that language.